if all the properties on a type already conform to codable, then the type itself can also conform to codable with no extra work from us. Swift will do all the work to synthesize functions to archive and unarchive objects of that type for us. However, this does not work with property wrappers like at published which means making the codable conformance take some more work. Now to fix this, we're going to implement that codable conformance by hand. And it'll fix the app published problem, but it's also a good skill to have in the future because it lets you control exactly how your data is saved and loaded. First, let's create a simple type that recreates the problem we're facing. We'll say there's a class called user, which is an observable object and codable. I'll give it one value, name is Paul Hudson. And that code is gonna compile absolutely fine because string here, this thing, conforms codable out of the box. However, if we mark this thing at published var name, then our code will no longer compile. It's saying this thing does not conform to decodable. And if you zoom in, you'll see it's not encodable as well. Now this thing here, at published isn't magic, right? The name property wrapper comes from the fact that our name property is automatically wrapped inside another type. And it's gonna add some additional functionality. In this case, it's going to announce changes to any Swift UI view that's watching us. So in the case of this at published property wrapper, this thing is actually its own struct called published. And it can store any kind of value. That's where the name comes from. It's a struct called published. Now, previously we looked at how to make generic methods that work with any kind of value, and the published struct uses a similar technique. The whole type itself is generic, meaning you can make an instance of published with a type attached to it, like published string or published int. But you can't make a published object by itself without a type. It doesn't make sense. This is a fairly fundamental thing we've seen with arrays and sets and similar. If I had an array of names as an array, but didn't say array string, array int, array double, whatever, it wouldn't work. We understand arrays have to have a type behind them. Sets have to be a set of string or a set of int or a set of bool or, or whatever. We can't just say set or array or similar. Now Swift already has rules in place. Sorry, one second, dog, dog is calling. Uh, so it already has rules in place to say if an array contains codable types, then the array itself is also codable. So we can read and write arrays easily. Same is true of dictionaries and sets. It makes our life easier. However, SwiftUI does not provide that same convenience for the published struct. It has no rule saying if the published object contains a codable data, then the published thing itself is also codable. So as a result, we've got to make this type, this user type here, conform to codable ourselves. We've got to tell Swift which properties of this thing should be loaded and saved, and how to do both those actions, how to load and how to save. Isn't that right? Yeah. Neither of those steps are terribly hard, so we're just gonna dive into the first one, telling Swift which properties I know you want to hold my hand as I talk, I know. <laughs> so hungry. Um, telling Swift which properties should be loaded and saved. This is done using an enum that conforms to a special protocol called coding key. And this means every case of our enum is a value that should be coded, should be archived and unarchived, like this. So we're gonna say, uh, up here, there's an enum inside our user type here called coding keys which is a coding key, like that. Here are the keys you want to code, to archive and unarchive. I'm gonna say case name. The name property should be written. So this thing here, the enum's called coding keys, and it contains coding key instances. So name is a coding key, that's what I'm saying. And that's how we do it. That's all it takes to say, please save the name property. Uh, it is conventionally called coding keys. It doesn't have to be, but it usually is. The next step is to make a custom initializer that will be given some kind of container. And it will use that to 
read values for all our properties, in this case, just name. And this would mean learning a few things at the same time, but let's get the code first. We're gonna say uh, in here, it's complaining we don't import, import a decodable. That means it can't be converted from data to an object. So we've got to add our initializer. If we just do init in here, you'll see this one here is the exact one we want to use. Required init from decoder, decoder throws. I hit return on that. And I'll explain the code in a second. Let's just write it out first. Uh, let container equals try decoder dot container keyed by coding keys dot self. Name equals try container dot decode string dot self for key dot name. Okay. There's not a lot of code there, but there, I think there's at least four new things in those three and a bit lines of code. First, this is handed a new type called decoder. This contains all our data, but it's down to us to figure out how to read it. It is not a JSON decoder or some kind of XML or who knows what decoder, custom YAML decoder, I don't know what. It's just a general decoder. We don't care where this data came from, only that we can read values from it. However, this initializer is marked with an interesting keyword, required. What this means is anyone who subclasses our user class with a custom implementation perhaps of, of the initializer or whatever, they must override the initializer with custom data to make sure they add their own values. We're saying, just give me the name. But whoever subclasses this must then say their own initializer with their own keys and our keys to initialize the whole thing correctly. So we're saying this is required in subclasses. You must add that. If you remove it, Swift will shout loudy. You must have required here. An alternative is to mark this thing as a final class. And that works because now there are never going to be any subclasses. It can't be subclassed anymore. So we haven't got to say you must implement this in subclasses because there'll never be a subclass anymore. Either one works. I don't really mind. We're going to stick with a, a required init, but either one works here. Okay. Inside there, we've asked our decoder for a container, a bunch of values. And we're saying this will have the keys of our coding keys enum, this thing here. It will expect to find a name in there. If it doesn't, bang, this try will throw an error. It won't be handled here, so it'll be handled somewhere else where we're doing the decoding. So we're saying this container must have, dog fur, sorry, must have uh, all the cases listed inside of our coding keys, which is currently just name. Um, and if they don't exist, throw an error, refuse to continue. So it's really important we're saying our coding keys. And that matters because when it comes to decoding a specific string down here, find a string, we can now say for key dot name. It'll look for this exact key in our coding keys. This is much, much nicer than user defaults. If you think about it, that was all string based. It would be string name and now it's dot name. There's no chance of typos or the wrong capital letter or similar. It's exactly right every time. If it can find that string, and it is a string, it'll be put into name. So it's really, really nice. Also, we're making it clear, this thing is going to be a string. If we changed name to be an int, for example, which wouldn't make sense, but if we, if we did, it would say, wait a minute, you're trying to decode a string here. You can't put a string into an integer. So it's really, really type safe and avoids typos. It's a, it's a big improvement over user defaults. There is one more task we have to implement here before the user class conforms to the codable protocol. We've made this initializer here so that Swift can decode data, like JSON or similar, into this type. But we also have to tell Swift how to encode this type, how to convert a user instance into finished data, ready to go off to JSON or XML or YAML or who knows what. 
This step is basically the reverse of, of the initializer. We're going to go ahead and be handed an encoder and then say, go ahead and make container keyed by coding keys and then write out our values attached to each key. So we'll say in here, again, use code completion, enc, and you'll see encode to encoder appears. Bang, that's the one there. You, come on, I'm trying to work here. <laughs> Va container equals, yes, thank you, encoder uh, dot container keyed by, and again, it's going to be coding keys dot self. We're gonna write out those key names, just name in our case, but those ones there. And then we'll call try, because it might fail. Uh, container dot encode, and this time we'll encode our name for the key, you're distracting me dog, for the key dot name. So write our name to the key name. So we're saying decode name to name and uh, encode name to name. It sounds repetitive, but it actually works really, really well because the coding keys can actually be custom in more advanced implementations. You could say encode name to username, for example, and decode from username. It's entirely possible. Anyway, now our code compiles. Swift knows the data we want to write out when we convert this thing to JSON or XML or YAML or who knows what, and also how to convert that back from JSON or XML ever into our data. That's all it takes. I realize it's a bit dense at first, but I hope we can see some real advantages here compared to the stringly typed API of user defaults. You know, it's, it is so much harder to make a mistake with these custom code implementations. There's no more strings everywhere for names and so forth. And it automatically checks we're writing a string in the right places and reading a string in the right places for us. You're so hungry.